There's seven major ways to build a quantum computer. And as you pointed out, we can build them either with natural qubits or synthetic qubits. Mm. A natural qubit, an example there would be a neutral atom. That's one of the dark horses in this race, one that hasn't got as much attention but is scaling very rapidly. This is where you take a, a neutral atom, not an ion, so it's not uh, an ion trap computer, but it's neutral, It's not doesn't have any charge. You manipulate it with lasers. Several people won Nobel Prizes, such as Steve Chu and others, for showing us how to manipulate various entities with, with lasers. You we get them use down to techniques. near absolute zero. Yes. Exactly. We use those techniques to set uh, the atom, which now becomes the qubit, into a certain state. And again, let's remember that quantum bits or short qubits can be in the state of zero or one, just like a transistor could be in zero, one, a bit can be in zero, one, but they can also be in superpositions in combinations of zero and one. And that gives us an infinite palette to draw from. And that qubit, we can say, is going to be some part zero, some part zero, sorry, some part zero, some part one, or a third this, and two thirds that. We can have different combinations. Everything in between. Yes. And everything in between. And so we represent uh, these qubits in very different ways than just the normal transistor. And so that neutral atom, we can manipulate into one of those states. Uh, we could read that state. And then we can operate on that state. And that's what's critical to a quantum computer, the ability to initiate a state on a qubit, operate uh, a set of operations on those states, and, and then, then read at it. the very end, read it out yes. uh, at, the, at the very end. And, and so those are critical things in a quantum computer. And now, in fact, neutral atom quantum computers are scaling faster than almost every other kind of uh, quantum computer. Doesn't mean the other ones are out. But advantages to neutral atoms are that they're basically room temperature, easy to transport, quite compact. And you're starting with a compartment of gas, um, let's say rubidium uh, as an example, where you already have hundreds of millions of these neutral atoms in the actual container. And to do things that are useful with quantum computers, we generally know that we're going to need to do the error correction. Let's use, for the sake of this conversation, a ratio of 1,000 to 1, 1,000 physical qubits to one error corrected or logical qubit, right? 1,000 yes. to 1 ratio. Really, really so important for folks to, to recognize because you hear about all these quantum computers that have 100 qubits, 127 qubits. Those are physical qubits, qubits exactly, Peter, and right. They're not the functional error corrected that's qubits. Correct. Yeah. That's and correct. and when you so so where are we today in this in this race? So today we're at you know a few hundred of these um physical qubits. Uh really uh some papers have claimed to make one logical qubit, but we're really not at the point of having a set of logical qubits of error corrected qubits that we could really manipulate at this time. Now that will change very rapidly. If you look at the photonic side, using photonics, that's another promising approach mm -hmm. exemplified by uh, PsiQuantum, uh, both in California and Australia, and also Photonic, a company in Canada, as well as a number of labs working on photonics. The Chinese, by the way, are making good progress as well in photonics. Uh, Pan Jianwei, the leader of the quantum a program in China himself is a photonics-oriented physicist, and so that was the first uh, quantum computer. My, that my he favorite, my favorite science fiction, my favorite science fiction stories are always about you know massive quantum computers buried under Beijing that brought about AI superintelligence. And yeah, yeah. Well, there, there is there, there are quantum computers deep, deep inside these universities that are run by Pan Jianwei, but they're not in Beijing. They're about two-hour fast train ride from Shanghai. Uh, <laughs> In a, in a different place. But yes, they are there. They are there. Um, but in any case, uh, so you have photonics. And one of the advantages that the photonics people will tell you is that we can mass produce these qubits using silicon photonics. We can use some of the same techniques of the semiconductor industry. In fact, PsyQuantum uses global foundries, uses one of the big mm. fabs out sure. there to mass produce this by hopefully the millions. And so if you want to do something like crack RSA, right? Let's say you want to crack the encryption 
protocols that are used throughout the world that are the bedrock of our economy. The reason why we have- You want 100... to crack my Bitcoin wallet? And yes, just, Peter, yes. that's what we want to do. We're going to crack right in and, and break the chain. Um, and, and in fact, you want to do that with either RSA, which has been around since 1978, since R, S, and A, Ravesh Shamir and Edelman uh, gave us RSA. If you want to crack ECC, elliptic curve cryptography. So uh, blockchain, you mentioned blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, you know, Ethereum, these are all based on either RSA or or uh, ECC, if you want to crack those, but more even bigger than just blockchain, every ATM uh, transaction, every mm -hmm. wire transfer, every e-commerce using a credit card on Amazon, every single transaction, every WhatsApp, when, you, when you're on WhatsApp, it says encrypted end to end mm -hmm. on the WhatsApp messages there. What is that encryption? That is RSA and ECC. So if you want to crack that, estimates are we'll need roughly 5,000 or so logical qubits. Maybe we can get away with 4,200, but let's just say 5,000 error corrected qubits, which using our 1,000 to 1 ratio, Peter, let's go back then and say 5 million physical qubits. So we're at a few hundred physical qubits today, yes. and we're going to need 5 million of these things.